A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, Chapter 25. Johnny was one for taking notions. He'd take a notion that life was too much for him and start drinking heavier to forget it. Francie got to know when he was drinking more than usual. He walked straighter coming home. He walked carefully and slightly sideways. When he was drunk, he was a quiet man. He didn't brawl, he didn't sing, he didn't grow sentimental. He grew thoughtful. People who didn't know him thought that he was drunk when he was sober because sober he was so full of song and excitement. When he was drunk, strangers looked on him as a quiet, thoughtful man who minded his own business. Francie dreaded the drinking periods, not on moral grounds, but because Papa wasn't the man she knew then. He wouldn't talk to her or anybody. He looked at her with the eyes of a stranger. When Mama spoke to him, he turned his head away from her. When he got over a drinking time, he'd take a notion that he had, had to be a better father to his children. He felt that he had to teach them things. He'd stop drinking for a while, take a notion to work hard, and devote all his spare time to Francie and Neely. He had the same idea that Katie's mother, Mary Romilly, had about education. He wanted to teach his children all that he knew so that at 14 or 15, they would know as much as he knew at 30. He figured they could go on from there, picking up their own knowledge, and according to his calculations, when they reached 30, they would be twice as smart as he'd been at 30. He felt that they needed lessons in, for what passed in his mind, geography, civics, and sociology. So he took them over to Bushwick Avenue. Bushwick Avenue was the high-toned boulevard of old Brooklyn. It was a wide, tree-shaded avenue. The houses were rich and impressively built of large granite blocks with long stone stoops. Here lived the big-time politicians, the moneyed brewery families, the well-to-do immigrants who had been able to come over first class instead of steerage. They had taken their money, their statuary, and their gloomy oil paintings and had come to America and settled in Brooklyn. Automobiles were coming into use, but most of these families still clung to their handsome horses and magnificent carriages. Papa pointed out and described the various equipages to Francie. She watched in awe as they rolled by. There were small lacquered dainty ones lined with tufted white satin, with a large fringed umbrella that was used by fine and delicate ladies. There were adorable wicker ones with a bench along each side on which lucky children sat while they were pulled along by a Shetland pony. She stared at the capable looking governesses who accompanied these children, women from another world in capes and starch string bonnets who sat sideways on the seat to drive the pony. Francie saw practical black two-seaters drawn by a single high-stepping horse controlled by dandified young men in kid gloves with edges turned back to look like inverted cuffs. She saw staid family vehicles drawn by dependable-looking teams. These coaches did not impress Francie very much because every undertaker in Williamsburg had a string of them. Francie liked the handsome cabs best. How magic were they with only two wheels and that funny door that closed by itself when a passenger sat back in the seat. Francie thought in her innocence that the doors were meant to protect the passenger from flying horse manure. If I were a man, thought Francie, that's the job I'd like to have, driving one of them. Oh, to sit up high in the back with a brave whip in a socket close to hand. Oh, to wear such a great coat with large buttons and a velvet collar and a squashed down high hat with a ribbon cockade in the band. Oh, to have such an expensive-looking blanket folded over her knees. Francie imitated the driver's cry under her breath. Carriage, sir? Carriage! Anybody, said Johnny, carried away by his personal dream of democracy, can ride in one of those handsome cabs, provided that they got the money. So you can see what a free country we got here. What's free about it if you have to pay? asked Francie. It's free in this way. If you have the money, you're allowed to ride in them no matter who you are. In the old countries, certain people aren't free to ride in them, even if they have the money. Wouldn't it be more of a free country, persisted Francie, if we could ride in them for free? No. Why? Because that would be socialism, concluded Johnny triumphantly, and we don't want that over here. Why? Because we got democracy, and that's the best thing there is, clinched Johnny. There were rumors that New York City's next mayor would come from Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn. The idea stirred Johnny. 
Look up and down this block, Francie, and show me where our future mayor lives. She looked and then had to hang her head and say, I don't know, Papa. There, announced Johnny, as though he were blowing a trumpet fanfare. Someday that house over there will have two lamp posts at the bottom of the stoop, and no matter where you roam in this great city, he orated, and if you come across a house with two lamp posts, you know that the mayor of the greatest city in the world lives there. What will he need two lamp posts for? Francie wanted to know, because this is America, and in a country where such things are, concluded Johnny vaguely, but, but very patriotically. You know that the government is by the people, for the people, of the people, and shall not perish from the face of the earth, the way it does in the old countries. He began to sing under his breath. Soon he was carried away by his feeling and started to sing louder. Francie joined in. Johnny sang, You're a grand old flag, you're a high-flying flag, and forever in peace may you wave. People stared at Johnny curiously and one kind lady threw him a penny. <laughs> Francie had another memory about Bushwick Avenue. It was tied up with the scent of roses. There were roses, roses, Bushwick Avenue. Streets emptied of traffic, crowds on the sidewalk, the police holding them back, always the scent of roses. Then came the cavalcade, mounted policemen in a large open motor car in which was seated a genial, kindly looking man with a wreath of roses around his neck. Some people were weeping with joy as they looked at him. Francie clung to Papa's hand. She heard people around her talking. Just think, he was a Brooklyn boy, too. Was, you dope. He still lives in Brooklyn. Yeah? Yeah. And he lives right here on Bushwick Avenue. Look at him. Look at him, a woman cried out. He did such a great thing, and he's still an ordinary man like my husband, only better looking. It must have been cold up there, said a man. It wonders me he didn't freeze his watsits off, said a body boy. A cadaverous looking man tapped Johnny on the shoulder. Mac, he inquired, do you actually believe that there's a pole up there sticking out on top of the world? Sure, answered Johnny. Didn't he go up there and turn around and hang the American flag on it? Just then a small boy hollered out, here he comes! Ah! Oh. Francie was thrilled by the sound of admiration that swayed the crowd. When the car came past where they were standing, carried away by excitement, she yelled out shrilly, Hooray for Dr. Cook! Hooray for Brooklyn!